you know, I've referred to this as, this as the, the, the session on practice, insofar as we're going to start looking at the actual data that we use, what some of the algorithms that we use are, and um, how we then evaluate the predictive performance. And again, building on this um, flow diagram that, that, that we started with, or, or, or that we left the last session with. So for, for this next um, <coughs> 45 minutes or hour or so, we're going to think about what are the actual biological and environmental data sets that we're going to put into the models. And we've already touched on a number of the kind of considerations already in, in some of the discussions this morning, but I'm going to give you some examples and, and flag some data sources and the kinds of things that you should be um, thinking about. So really, again, trying to stick to this, give us a structure for these, these few sessions. We're going to talk about this first in terms of how we get some records of where we find the species, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the environmental data sets that, that we might use. So here's just flagging some example sources of species distribution data. These are the classic cases you know, you're interested in, a particular region, a particular species. How do you go about getting some records for, for, for that, that species and area? Of course, one of the classics is you go out and you collect some data. So personal data collection, a lot of PhDs, and that will have a fieldwork component where you're actually out in the field collecting your own data, and that's very cool. Um, uh, a difficulty is that within the scope of a PhD or, or that, then often you're not really necessarily collecting the kind of quantity of macroecological, so large-scale bi biogeographic data that we might need to run these kinds of models. So often that kind of data collection might be contributing to a larger data set um, to, to run these kinds of models. Okay, but, but cool. I, I, uh, basically, my PhD didn't involve any field work at all, um, partly because I'm not very good at field work and partly just because I was using other people's data. So um, that's what we often do in this, in this field. We're, we're, we're collating, we're pulling together data sets, which of course, remember, raises important considerations about giving credit for where your data comes from, for the folks who have actually collected it, inviting co-authorship or um, acknowledgements and these kinds of things. So we're often in the business of using and collating data sets that we haven't necessarily collected ourselves and it's uh, always important to consider credit for those who have collected the data. So other things, of course, you might pull out data from large databases or surveys. So there's examples of the uh, BTO's breeding bird survey in this country. There's the Christmas bird count. There's a North American breeding bird survey as well. So these big kind of initiatives, sometimes they have... Um, uh, uh, a fairly long history, so you'll be able to get atlases going back a few years. Um, a chunk of my PhD was digitizing old data, set, old data sets from literally paper atlases, and a couple of us were chatting over lunch about the issues and frustrations of, of, of doing that job, but it's kind of a data collection to a degree in that you're actually digitizing old data from atlases. You know, it might be data from the 60s, 70s that tells you about distributions back then. Um, but that's something you can do in a GIS. It's pretty boring work. Um, it's a bit tedious, but you know, it's, it's pulling data out. It's another source of data, actually physical um, maps. Um, a lot of the data increasingly comes from citizen science initiatives um, that I'm sure you're well aware of. Here's just one example. iSpot is um, a, a, a kind of naturalist community. iNaturalist is another example. Um, iSpot's... Uh, uh, a community of, of people you register and you go out in the field and you take a photo, you know, smartphone, you take a picture of a of a organism, you might not know what it is, but you geolocate it on your on your smartphone and you just instantly upload it to the database. And then there's a system for kind of um, crowd-driven, if you like, species IDs. So someone else comes along, sees that picture and says, oh, I know what that is, that's so-and-so. Um, and then, of course, it goes into the database. So th this is increasingly, and I think will be over the next few decades, a real amazing way to start accelerating, you know, the amount of data that we have to work with these kinds of crowdsourcing initiatives that take advantage of smartphones and that. You know, you literally, there's something, take a photo, phone automatically geolocates it, upload through an app, and it's into a big database. Um, so this is, th there particularly in ornithology and that, you know, there's, there's, there's an awful lot of these kinds of initiatives. So databases there that, that, that you can go after and, and, and get data from. Um, 
Collections from natural history museums is another one. We've already talked about the temporal element to that, but you know, that's a classic, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you're in the collections, in the jars, picking things out, getting the label, getting the XY coordinates. Um, you know, there's a lot of folks who are actually doing that, but increasingly, you know, there's the museums will have their online databases that you can tap into. You say, where's so-and-so, and what's in the, you know, hopefully you'll get some records back that, you know, species X was found at a particular location and a particular date. Big advantage of that, of course, is that you have the um, specimens should be actually available somewhere in a museum. So, um, in terms of being confident about the species IDs, you know, you always have a physical, a voucher specimen that you can go back to and, and look at, which is quite different. You know, we've, we've talked about data quality, um, data coming in from citizen science surveys and, and things like that. You know, is the georeferencing okay? Are the species IDs okay? All things to consider. Um, and then there are these kind of online resources. Of course, they're related to the databases and the citizen science initiatives, but things like Map of Life that I showed you, which is pulling data and plotting it from, from different sources. The biggest of those is GBIF that I've mentioned, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. This is a map um, from their site of the, what's that, 449 million georeferenced occurrence records um, that, that were published as of, as of this month. It's just like a, a density map, so you'll begin to pick out the, we're about here, is the UK and North America, etc. Um, so there's huge you know, amounts of data that are being contributed and then collated in these central databases. And that has a nice interface. You can go in, you can query your species in a particular region or globally and pull up all the occurrence records that are in the database associated with that species. You can download them, you can have a spreadsheet that says here's my species and this is the X and Y coordinate as to where they were found. So another good source of, um, of occurrence records. And just be, you know, be, be thinking about for your particular application. You know, are you are you interested in the kind of maybe it's a large scale study that's um, looking at say across a continental scale and is looking at say um, reserve selection, something like that, where you're interested in lots of different species, so you need huge amounts of data. That might be a case where you're really interested in mining some of these online databases using citizen science initiatives. You're going to accept that not all the records are of really really high quality but hopefully you get enough of a picture from this big mass of data that you, know, you, can, you can do some useful analyses. Versus are you interested in, say, a particular group in a particular region and you're interested in um, niche evolution within just a, you know, a, a small group or, or something like that, then, then you might not be wanting to accept you know, data from some of these sources where you, you want lots of species and lots of um, you know, over a large area, you might be really interested in the museum records where you can actually go, you can collect, you can look at the specimens, you can check the IDs are okay and things like that. So be thinking not, not just what's out there, but what's the kind of quality data and what type of data do you need for, for your application. So some important considerations that we've kind of touched on, but I want to flick through in a, in a few slides to, to hit a few of the kind of just classic things that, that come up that we get asked. I've got... So presence only versus presence absence data, that's a classic we've mentioned, but it's, I'll emphasise it in, 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 in a couple of minutes. And to ask this question, you know, when is an absence really an absence? All right, when is the absence data useful? And this is a really, really key question, not just for building the models, but also for testing the performance of the models. How many records do I need is just a classic question that, that we get asked. How many records do I need to build the model? There's no easy answer to that, but I'll, I'll touch on that in a minute. Um, are my data biased? Something that we kind of have already um, touched on this morning. And then um, how um, spatially accurate are my, are my records as well? That's another thing that we mentioned, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about. So what do we mean by presence only versus presence absence data? Pretty obvious, really, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, there would be an example of some presence only data. This is typical for such as, um, uh, you know, the work that we do in Madagascar, where we have very few occurrence records. Um, uh, we have collected the data from museum collections, where you don't have a specimen that says, I, weren't, I, you know, I wasn't found here. It's just presence-only data. And the, 
the, the majority of data that we have is, is, is just presences. But we could hypothetically, and they are just made up in this slide, um, we could visit areas and say, well, we didn't find the species there, right? And that would be absence data. So that would be physically going, looking, not finding the species. And then there's a, the, this would be another example, another data set that, that we might work with. This is a, a, the white beak sedge, so a, a plant plotted across Europe. You'll see it's on a nice um, grid. I th think, can't quite remember the resolution of these cells, but they're, they're pretty big, um, pretty big cells. This is, this is, these are data from the Atlas Flora Europea. Um, but, you know, you get to see the main range margins for these species, so you'll immediately be thinking, you know, does that, what, what does that correlate with? You know, what's the kind of variable that's controlling the northern and southern distributions of these species? In that particular data set, we only really have presence records. But some of the methods and some of the publications that have used this data set have used presence-absence methods, because in a landscape like this, with a data set like this, it's pretty reliable that the species hasn't actually been found down in some of these areas. So people will often kind of make the assumption that the species is absent. So when, when is an absence really an absence? I'm not going to go through everything on this slide, but um, this is where we start thinking about false absences in particular. So th this is, um, you can read the, the details about it in the, the um, Ecological Niches and Geographic Distributions book that, that I've mentioned a few times. But what they tried to do here is essentially break it down into the different steps. So, so firstly, let, let's ask, is, is this particular site accessible to the species? Think of our BAM diagram that we started with and we had the, the movement element there. You know, what's the dispersal ability of the species? So has that site been accessible to the species? Well, yes, yes or no. Okay, so that's a, a first. It's kind of present or absent. Could it actually get there? Then we ask, well, is, it, is, is the environment abiotically suitable? Is it too hot, too cold, too dry, too wet, etc.? Okay, and then the, the open, open circles are basically saying species is present and, 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 or recorded as present, and this is recorded as absent. So again, it might be you know, present or absent. And then we might say, well, is it bio uh, biotically suitable? You know, is that particular site biotically suitable? And again, we've got kind of recorded present or recorded absent. So you'll see how it, how it comes through. But essentially, the only way you're going to get actually a record that the species is in, actually, in actual fact found there is where it meets our requirements, that the species has been able to get there, where it's abiotically suitable and it's biotically suitable. Again, think back to our, our kind of Venn diagram of, of, of BAM, of bio, biotic, abiotic and movement. You know, that's, that's what's really going to end up in the presence of the species. And then you've got these extra things. Well, was it actually visited by the observer? Did, uh, has an observer actually visited there? Think back to the potato diagram where we had some sites that simply hadn't been visited, right? Has the site actually been visited? And then when it was visited, was the record correctly made or not? As someone who doesn't do that much field work, then I, I assume that these people are not doing their job properly if they go there and don't find the species, even though they the species is actually there. But of course, species are only there for certain times of the year. A lot of them are cryptic, so they might be hiding, you know, very difficult to find and that. So you're only actually going to end up with a presence record that the species one was found there when you've satisfied all of those elements, right? And yet there are all these other different possibilities that, that you can trace through where you're going to get, in effect, absences, but are they really absences? Well, this is a, a clearly a false absence because it was there and it wasn't recorded there. The person visited there but just didn't spy it. Went the wrong time of year, didn't look hard enough, didn't go out the right time of day, didn't look, lift up the log that it was hiding under. Um, you're going to get cases, for example, where it's an absence due to um, an unsuitable environment. Okay? Well, that's um, kind of what we're interested in. We want absences where it's, it's, it's absent, really, because it's not suitable. So that, that's, that's pretty good. But you're going to get cases as well where it's absent because of inaccessibility of the cell. Because the species, you know, uh, well, uh, different cases, but either the, 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 the recorder hasn't been to have a look or the species couldn't actually move there. But in effect, that would be a kind of, for our purposes, not a useful absence record because we're only interested in absence records where the species isn't there, it really isn't there, and it really isn't there because the environment really isn't suitable. 
right? Because that in our statistical correlative approach is that's really what's telling our model that it's abiotically not suitable for the species. All the other things are not really telling us what we need to know. So that's a way of kind of saying we need to be really careful about absence records. We need to be careful about what they mean in our data set. How good's the sampling? Are they, as a species, really not there? Why is it not there? Is it not there just simply because it's never had the opportunity to move there? It's, it's fallen at the first hurdle, if you like. Is it not suitable? Is it not found there because um, it's just outcompeted there? So it might not, it might not be there because it's outcompeted by another species, but the environment might still be right abiotically. And if our environmental variables that we're using to build the model are abiotic environmental variables, then we're, we're falsely informing the model that the species is not there because of the abiotic environment, but it, it might not be that at all. Okay, so you'll begin to see, you know, think through this at more length, but you'll, be, you'll begin to see the, the complexities of dealing with absence data. Presence data, yeah, species is there. Absence data, lots of complications. So do we really want to be using it? Well, often, if we've got really good absence data and it's really true absences that the species isn't there and it's not there because of the abiotic environment, then that's useful information, actually. You can build statistically better models. But often those kinds of requirements aren't met in terms of really providing good absence data. All right? Again, it's difficult to say generically, but be very cautious when trying to incorporate absence data. And we'll talk about it when evaluating models as well. It's a similar, similar issues come up. How many records do I need? How many occurrence records do I need? Again, I'm sorry, it's not an easy answer. Depends what you're trying to do, and I'll just give you a couple of examples to kind of il illustrate this. Um, so this is um, our uh, white beak sedge. I just showed you this example data set. This is our observed distribution that you've, that you've just seen. This is a simulated distribution. So this is kind of what you get out from an ecological niche model. It just happens this is a model built using an artificial neural network. Again, that's not important. It might be from another method. But the principle is correlated or statistically associated the occurrence records with the environment, built the model, and pretty good fit, right? You look at that and you think um, capturing the main range, mar the, the, the main, uh, range margins in the south, in the north, pretty, pretty good, pretty good model. So that might be a case of where we've got such a good model. There seems to be a, 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 a good fit with the range margins seem to be controlled by p the kind of variables that we're using in the model. You know, we've obviously captured some sort of variable that's limiting that southern range and the northern range. Um, so that might be a case where, you know, we've clearly got a lot of data and we might do something like make a climate change projection with that. It's a data set that we've worked with and made climate change projections, for better or, or, or for worse. Because we, we have some confidence that we're building good models. We've got lots of data points. Contrast that with the example that we're going to look at in Madagascar, where we have very few occurrence records. So this is, these are cool critters, leaf-tailed geckos in Madagascar. Who's seen one of those there? Yeah just phenomenal and they range in size but the you see where they get where they get their names from that the, the, the tails are just phenomenal this particular he looks a bit evil i don't think they're always quite so like that but um um uh, yeah so 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 a couple of europlatus leaf-tailed geckos just a couple of examples there of, of distribution models that were built um for those species it happens to be maxent models but that's not the important point here there we've got very few occurrence records, so I certainly wouldn't and haven't done in, in my own work any, any um, applications where we're kind of projecting those distributions under future climate change. This is a good example of where we're basically saying, well, we've only got a few occurrence records, the black splotches here, the black stars, and we're going to use those to characterise environments that are kind of similar to where we've already observed the species. Remember this morning, that's what we talked about, that's all the models are doing. And then we're going to do things like send out field crews to look in some of these other sites. 
to see what else we might find. So they're very different applications. So in this kind of case, we've got very few occurrence records and we're comfortable saying, well, we've only got a few, but we're just based on these, those few records, we're going to say where else in the, in, in the landscape has similar environments and then we're going to go and look there. We might find the species, we might not, but that's a, a sensible application. In the previous one where we had a lot more data, we could build much more robust models, we knew probably where the species was presently absent and present, that was a good case where we had some confidence that we could, with caution, do some projections under climate change. Okay? So very different data sets, very different knowledge of, 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 of the species and their distributions to start with, so the applications that we feel limited to are, are quite different. Does that make sense? Are my data biased? Here's just a good example of some, um, in effect, biased data. So these were um, downloaded by a, by a colleague um, and, and plotted. This is just the European butterfly. Um, I'm not going to try and pronounce it embarrassingly, from GBIF. Um, and that's its distribution, apparently, according to GBIF. How many of you have got data that might be similar to this to a degree in terms of having these kinds of biases. Yeah, it's, pre it's pretty common. So, you know, it, it, it's clearly, there's been a load of sampling done here. I don't think anyone is just going to predict that in, in, you know, in a particular country it's, it's so prevalent and then you get outside. Some, uh, you know, other things to note is clearly not much sampling here. Here's on a grid. This, this data's clearly gridded, some of these data points. So very, very different biases, basically, in the data that, that, that we would need to, to, to think about. And there are ways to deal with these kind of biases in different modelling approaches. The classic thing is that you, in effect, need to know something about that bias. You need to know where the sampling was done, for example. If you have records of where sampling's been done, that's great. You can, you can incorporate that into the model, um, for example, in a Maxent model, and um, alleviate the, 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 the problems of bias that you have in your, in your data sets. Another thing that's done is using, it's often referred to as kind of target background group. So if you're interested in a particular species, a particular frog or a particular whatever, you might then actually use um, uh, communities of similar species that have been sampled and use those to tell you something about where the sampling has been. Okay? So if across this whole group, there are, there are these big holes across Europe where you don't have any records for any amphibians, then you can probably pull those areas kind of out of the data and say, well, there's just not the sampling there. But if other amphibians or reptiles or whatever group you're interested in have been sampled in those areas, then that will tell you that, you know, if you had a record for this species, then it, if the species was there, then it would have probably been found there. So you basically use you use the distribution of, of a larger set of species, a larger taxonomic grouping, to tell you where the sampling has occurred, and then you can build that into the model. Does that make sense? So there are ways to deal with it that within this kind of couple of days, we're not actually going to open up a data set for a particular model and do that. But, you know, within Maxent, for example, um, Stephen Phillips, 2009, wrote a, a really cool paper that sets out how to do that. And if you're using the Maxent interface, it's fairly straightforward to feed that data into the interface and, in effect, kind of take account of bias. But right now, what you need to be thinking about for your data sets are, have I got these biases? Do I need to deal with them? What's the implications for the kind of modelling that I'm, I'm trying to do and the kind of questions that I'm trying to answer? Okay. Um, so another question. How spatially accurate are your records? And this is just an example from, so Woodbury is, is near New York. We were looking at some of the data sets from um, these jars of, of, of specimens in, in the American Museum of Natural History where I used to work. And, you know, as I've said, they all have a little label on them with an XY coordinate on, but particularly from a few years ago where people didn't have GPS units and that, you get things on labels like this from near Woodbury five miles east of Woodbury, ten minutes along the path leading out of Woodbury. You know, these are actually really the, the kind of data, and you might pull it up in GBIF and it might have an actual locality, but in reality, the data might 
be a lot more uncertain than that. And again, you need to understand for your data and for your application what the kind of implications of this, of this would be. Um, and there are ways, there are tools out there to, to deal with it where you would basically draw uncertainty in effect circles around a point where you, you would put a circle around and say, well, we don't know, it's, you know, the species is somewhere within this 10 mile radius. And then you can do things like sample within that 10 kilometers and um, take some samples from that and build a model and then take some other samples from that and build a model and then see how the randomizations within the uncertainty actually affects the model. So there are, there are cool things that you can do, happy to chat about it more, but you need to be aware of these kinds of issues in your data and not plow through and suddenly think towards the end of a thesis, well, hang on, I've got this uncertainty that I, I just haven't accounted for. And often what we're doing is dealing with messy data sets. And it's not that we can just suddenly solve. So it's five miles, five miles east of Woodbury, you know, where, where actually is that? It's actually that there is uncertainty and we need to just account for the uncertainty. So you need to start doing clever things. Like I've mentioned, you, you put a five mile radius around your point and then su subsample within that multiple times and ask, does that affect my outputs? That's the kind of test that you might need to do if there is uncertainty there to, to look at how that influences, how that propagates through and will influence your results. Might be that that kind of level of, you know, five miles just doesn't make that much difference, particularly if you were, say, modeling at 10 kilometer resolution but it might be really important and you, you need to be aware of that. Um, another source of um, spatial uncertainty is, <coughs> relates to projections, geographic coordinate systems. Of course, the Earth is a sphere. We usually work with latitude and longitudes that are, in effect, angles from the centre center of the Earth, but when we then um, try to you know, draw a two-dimensional map, we spatially manipulate that sphere to fit it onto a map. And there's, there's many, many different ways of doing that manipulation. You, you kind of have to rubber sheet it, if you like, to go from a sphere to a flat map. You can introduce different spatial biases um, in doing that. And here's just one example um, where the, the, the positional shifts due to the datum um, I, that, that you're using, which is in effect the kind of coordinate system. It, it affects what, what shape of the Earth you're assuming, because the Earth isn't a, it isn't a sphere it, precisely. So we're not going to get into the details. That's a whole other thing to start thinking about geographic reference systems and things like that. But the bottom line is that modern day GIS systems make it easy to deal with different projections. If you're working in a particular reg region, there will be a good projection system for that region and a GIS system will make it pretty easy to convert between systems and do this rubber sheeting, do this transformation to go from one coordinate system to another. But you have to know what the coordinate system is that you are working in. Okay, so whenever you're downloading data or getting it from a colleague or a fellow PhD student or a supervisor or any number of sources, one of the first questions you've got to ask is, what is the geographic coordinate system that we are working with here? Without knowing that, we can make some assumptions, like the safest bet is that it's latitude and longitude, and it's WGS 1984 is the kind of standard system. But if it's wrong, so this is assuming a standard system, and you choose a, uh, we're not going to go into them now, but any of these other different assumptions as to how you do the rubber sheeting, where the centre of the earth is, what shape the earth is, um, you can get all sorts of errors come in there. So you must know and you must be asking this kind of metadata, what's the coordinate system that these data are collected in? And there's no kind of backtracking to work it out later. You need to know when your data comes in, what's the coordinate system? Thinking a bit more about environmental data sets, and I know you can't read the details of this, but remember I'm going to distribute the slides um, where you can, I've put this up basically so that you can use it as reference in the future. Plus, as a reference, okay, this is just pinched from that, from that paper. The bottom line here is that this is a, a table of some sources of environmental data. Um, so we've got a website where you get the data from, the resolution of those data and then what the variables are. So things like climate, temperature, precipitation, seasonality, solar radiation, relative humidity, vapor pressure. There are data sets available, data sets at one kilometer resolution. Uh, one of them is 
the World Klim data set, um, crew at, at University of East Anglia, the climate research unit, I think they are, has some cool data sets, FAO, DAMET. So there are different data sets out there. You know, you need to go out and you need to look at what's available for your study area um, and, and, and start looking and seeing what's, what's available. But there are some sources. But it gives you an impression of the kind of data sets that, that are out there. Rainfall and cloud cover, um, that's quite cool. There's a NASA data source there because remotely sensed information can, can, we can work back from that to, um, you know, from cloud cover that can tell you about rainfall. Density of clouds tells you about rainfall. So there's some pretty um, cool data sets that, that are out there um, for, for rainfall and cloud cover. I'll show you one of those from Madagascar in a minute. Vegetation type, again, a lot of remote sensing data, percent tree cover, things like that. You're just going to get, there's masses of data out there to start playing with, essentially. Hydrology, streams, drainage basins, productivity, land cover, land use, soil, soil type. You get the impression. There's tons of data out there to start um, going out, looking for, downloading, and playing with. And remember what I said about, you know, that's kind of your starting point. You download the data, you get... You look at it and then you start thinking biologically, well, what can I do with these data to actually, um, uh, you know, generate some variables that, that we can use um, to do some distribution modeling. Here's a very similar thing um, from a, a, a paper that's uh, sources uh, of marine data sets. Um, so similar kind of um, sets of parameters. So sea surface chlorophyll, um, sea surface temperature, um, sea surface uh, wind speed, um, uh, depth, bathymetry, those kinds of things, resolution, again, and, and a bunch of different data sources. So um, I'm not going to go through them in any more detail there, but there are data sets out there for marine systems as well, for those of you who are interested in marine systems. Not as much, frankly, not as much as in terrestrial systems, um, and you've got a kind of third dimension to worry about as well in terms of the, uh, you know, depth. But um, th there are data sets out there for, for marine systems as well. I'm just going to give you an example. I've, I've said that um, you know, I do a lot of work in Madagascar, and this is just pulling out a few pictures of some of the data sets that we work with in Madagascar, that we've collated. We've built a GIS database from different sources over time, and we've built models based on these. You know, this is kind of for your for your study region, this is the kind of database, these are the kinds of variables that you, you might want to put together. So it's just zooming in on northern Madagascar, elevation. US Geological Survey have, this is one kilometer resolution, but I think there's considerably finer resolution available these days across the whole of the world um, for elevation. So this is, you know, this, these are the highlands in Northern Madagascar, Saratanana is the, the, the highest point in, northern, in, in Madagascar, um, and download that data, um, import it into a GIS, draw a pretty picture, format it, and it can go straight into a distribution model. Okay? Usually when we work with elevation, if we know about elevation, we can generate variables such as slope. You can do that in the GIS. You know about elevation, you can generate slope based on uh, elevation data. An aspect is another good one to work with. You know, what, 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 what way is, is that slope facing? Now, why might we work with slope and aspect rather than elevation? Can anyone think of, this is a fairly important point, why do we generally not, generally not, you'll find plenty of published papers that do, um, why do we generally not use elevation for these kinds of distribution models? The bottom line is that species... With, I'm sure we can brainstorm some exceptions, but species generally don't respond to elevation. So this would be a classic case of, you know, you can get that data, but biologically, what does that mean? Species don't respond to elevation. You might give some examples of hummingbirds that need a certain elevation, you know, air pressure to, to, to flap their wings, but then it's really air pressure, it's not elevation. It's a proxy. Elevation is a proxy for other variables like air pressure and, importantly, of course, like temperature. So, suppose we build a model for um, a particular species and we include elevation as a predictor variable and we build a really good model um, because we find that this species is restricted to, it's always found between six and 700 metres elevation. Build a really good model, um, great. 
We then try and project that model to, say, a different part of the world or under a climate change scenario or something where the environment's different. The species aren't responding to elevation, they're responding to temperature. So they might not be found at 600, 600 700 metres, they might be found higher than that as the temperature warms, for example. So it's a real key one that we don't generally want to be incorporating elevation as a predictor variable because it is a proxy for other things. And often we'll think we're building good models because the model is using elevation, but that's not, you know, think biologically. What's the species responding to? Well, it's probably responding to temperature, so let's use temperature. It might be responding to slope and aspect. I work a lot with amphibians and reptiles, and, you know, reptiles bask on certain angles of slope, and they like to be um, facing the sun, so aspect is also important. So those are, those are you know, potentially good variables that we can generate from elevation, but they're the variables that we might use in the model. So here's an example of um, just some climate data again that we have in our database from Madagascar. This is uh, mean annual temperature from the World Klim database. Um, you'll see we were just zooming in on um, elevation up in these northern highlands in Madagascar, the northern part of Madagascar and as was pointed out, there's a very close pattern, you know, correlation between the elevation and the temperature. That data is spatially interpolated, as we said this morning, from weather stations. We've got about 130 odd weather stations. There's a geostatistical process that takes into account elevation that is used to generate a nice map that looks smoothly across the whole of Madagascar at one kilometre resolution, like we know exactly what the temperature is per grid cell. Well, I think this is a really cool data set and it's one that we work with and I think have done some cool things with, but it's not as good as it looks. It looks like, you know, we know every one kilometre grid cell, but it's not. It's generated from a series of, of weather stations. Um, but again, it's just downloadable, worldclim.org. You can go and download these data. Pull them down globally and clip out your area of interest. You've got some data to work with. So this touches on now um, one of the comments that was made. I just want to flag that Climate, again, is not, you know, just one temporal time slice. Um, we tend to work with the present day, and, and the comment was made that was absolutely right. We usually work with a 30-year mean. That kind of tells us something about climate. In the World Klim data set, that's usually the case that it's a 30-year mean, but in reality, um, sometimes that's kind of, that rule's broken. If you've only got 20 years of data, well, it's, it's, it's thrown into the, the data set as well. But so when we talk about present day data, it's not, you know, what happened yesterday or what happened this, this year. It's, it's usually a 30 year, 30 year mean, um, you know, from, from the last 30 years. Then going back, there are um, data sets going back, for example, to the um, Holocene maximum. That's kind of the hottest it's been during the Holocene. So during the last 10, 12,000 years, um, about 6,000 years ago. The data, set, the data are generated from GCMs, um, or more formally AOGCMs, so Atmospheric Oceanic General Circulation Models. These are the big climate models, very complex, very computationally intensive, have been put together over many years. The Met Office has a, 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 you know, a famous one. There are various different ones around the world, but these are the, these are the climate models that, that, that are used in particular to make the future climate scenarios that we all hear about on the news but you can run them back into the past and estimate what the climate was like, you know, in, in the past. So going back to the Holocene maximum, 6,000 years, um, going back to the last glacial maximum, about 21,000 years, where it was a hell of a lot colder. Um, those data sets that are, are out there and you can download them from places like um, WorldClim has a data set that's basically um, using their baseline, their present day, and overlaying the uh, the, 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 the change fields they refer, you know, what, what the change has been, say, 6,000 years ago, 21,000 years ago, and then you can pull up a map that says, this is best guess of what the climate was like at that point in time, or at least, you know, during that period. Um, and then, of course, uh, we can go forward in time with uncertainty, but we commonly have predictions going forward for the 2020s, 2050s, and 2080s, and these are the data that you see in the news. IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I know there are a number of folks here who are interested in climate change applications. Well, these are the kinds of data sets that you will um, work with and we'll talk a little bit about tomorrow. Um, 
there are different data sets, but there are multiple general circulation models or AOGCMs. Uh, the HADCM3 um, might not even be the latest incarnation, but that's the Hadley Centre's model in, in effect the UK Met Office. It's, it's their model. There's a CSIRO one, that's the Australian one. There's a couple of North American ones, there's a Japanese one. Um, these are the, 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 the different models that are used to actually run um, the, the, the future climate scenarios. Um, you have the different models that function differently, um, all kind of based on the same physical principles. These, these are mostly mechanistic, you know, process-based models rather than the kind of statistical models that we're working with in, 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 in ecology that we're talking about. Um, but you have the different models, and the different models will make different predictions, okay? And that's what you see when, you know, there's all the debate in the IPCC and that, which model do you believe? Um, and there'll be a parallel because we'll talk in the next session about the different uncertainties from choosing different SDM algorithms. Um, they have a similar case with the GCMs. Um, so you've got different models and you've got different emission scenarios as well. So what you feed into those models are various parameters, but one of them is, you know, of course, the, the, the amount of greenhouse gases that we're putting into the atmosphere. So there are different emission scenarios ranging from your kind of business as usual to your more policy scenarios that we actually start doing something about greenhouse gas emissions. So what you end up with is a range of different scenarios from a range of different models. You're not just going to get a prediction for 2050 or a prediction for 2080. And another thing to emphasise, um, I just said 2050 and 2080, that was not really correct. It's always 2050s and 2080s because it's always... It's a 30-year mean, usually, around a particular point in time. So when someone says, I'm making a prediction for 2080, not really, they're making a prediction for a, a, a mean climate around that period. It's usually 30 years, I think, centred around 2085. But, you know, different data sets do different things. But it's climate, it's not weather, so it's not a year. It's, it's, it's a, you know, later in this century versus middle of the century. Okay. Those data are out there. You can download them from the IPCC data, set, data center. Bit of GIS hacking, if you like, to get them into the right format so that you can add them you know, as, as predictors or, or as, as inputs to a distribution model. But the data's out there. Bit of hacking, bit of playing with the data. You can download it and you're off. Another just example from data. Um, data set that we, we got from Kew Gardens, um, geology, you know, so this is telling us about um, different, you know, alluvial and lake deposits, different rock types, mangrove swamps, sandstones, quartzites, you know, different rock formations and that. Just another example of data that's out there. One reason that I wanted to throw this up was the original data that we got was, is vector polygon data. Those of you who are GIS people will understand that terminology. In effect, that means that the, the computer is storing um, lines that outline their polygons, their lines that outline a particular area. So these are polygons that's saying it's a particular, you know, um, ge geological substrate here and another one here and etc. Um, remember, as we came up this morning, that in this kind of modelling, we're, 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 it's cell-based modelling. In GIS terminology, it's raster. Modeling, So everything's pixelated at a certain resolution. So when we get these data, the vector polygons, um, and we're going to actually build them into the model, we had to rasterize that data. Okay, Again, it's just GIS terminology, but it's basically saying add a, a, a cell, a, a grid on top of this, and then say, you know, what, what's the geological substrate within each cell. So we go from that kind of data to this kind of blocky data that you'll be able to see, and it's at a certain resolution so that you can see the blocks. But that's the data that we would use to actually input to the model, the rasterized data. That's most of the models will need that kind of data input. So it's just to emphasize, you know, that might be the data that you can get, but that, uh, I don't know a distribution modeling kind of package that's going to be able to interpret the polygons. So you might have to do some GIS work first to rasterize it. That just means make it into a cell-based data set that you can then input into the model because all of our modeling is done cell-based. <laughs>
And then just just to flag, I mean, we could we could talk for the rest of the afternoon about remote sensing information, but it's just fantastic the amount of information that we can download from NASA and the like, um, remote remotely sensed information. So just a couple of the data sets that that that, that we use. This is from one of the sensors, AVHRR. Um, it's very fine resolution, uh, NDVI, Normalized Difference Vegetation um, Index. It's basically a measure of greenness, um, how much photosynthetic activity there is um, on the planet. So against fine resolution across the whole of the globe, we just downloaded it and windowed out Madagascar and, and, and plotted that. So it's telling us, in effect, where there's more or less vegetation. You can do that for your study region. The, da the data is available. Um, this one took a little bit more um, work from collating various um, uh, data sources, but we, we, we managed to get a map that was a pretty good uh, estimate of where there is actually forest cover and what percentage in a particular grid cell. I think these are one kilometer grid cells. We've got a, pr a, a, a pretty good estimate based on the remotely sensed information of what the percentage forest cover is in those grid cells. And, you know, Madagascar awful lot of deforestation that there has been and, and, and that it's crucial if we're trying to model distributions and if we're interested in reserve planning and that we need to know where the remaining fragments of forest are um, and we can draw those kind of maps and the only real way to do that is based on some of the new remote sensing information that we can get. It's not really the distribution modeling but it's the kind of work that you'll probably spend if you're doing this kind of work you'll spend most of your time doing GIS and things to manipulate your data and get the right variables and then the actual modeling you might just click a button and get an output. All right, I'm trying to emphasize that, that you know, this is where a lot of the key decisions are made. It's generating the data, generating the variables, understanding them, getting good data that you can then use to actually build your, your distribution model. So that's just flagging up a few of the, of the data sets that, that, that we use for, for Madagascar and have, have collated over a number of years and have published various papers doing different things with. A couple more things to, to mention, to think about. So, so I've just talked really about, we've talked about distribution data, where you might get it from, what are some of the key considerations there. And we've talked about this initial kind of collation of environmental data. But then I just wanted to just give you one example of this issue that I've mentioned about processing, we often refer to it as a kind of pre-processing, sometimes even building another model before we actually do the distribution modeling, which is to generate the predictor variables that are important for your species. And I'm overemphasizing it because it's so crucial. Think about the biology, think about your species. What are the important variables? Okay, so here's just an example from um, some work that I was uh, involved in where in effect, um, all I want to focus in on really is this. So this is the, the, the grand scale of what we were trying to do. We got some uh, data, we, uh, some uh, environmental data, we did some pre-processing, we built a model, happens to be an artificial neural network here, and we made some predictions. But before we put anything into the model, before any inputs went into this um, model, we did an awful lot of work actually building some other models that generated the input variables that we used to do the distribution modeling. So this is, you know, and these were basically process-based models. So we were interested in plants around Europe, and what's crucial for plants in particular is um, the amount of water that's available for them to grow, in effect, is, is you know, obviously fundamentally important. So we got a, a bunch of data on, on, on soils and we got a bunch of data on, on climate that we got from various different sources. And the soil data told us about things like, um, you know, what just if, it is, if it's a podzol or whatever type of soil it is. It told us about pH. It told us about, crucially, the water holding capacity of that type of soil. So we took the water holding capacity and we actually built a process-based model, wrote some code, um, that um, basically took, combined the, the, the soil data and the climate data, it had inputs of precipitation into a particular soil type that built up a reservoir during the year of water ba based on the, the water holding capacity of that type of soil. You know, if it was a clay, then it just pooled on top. If it was a different type of soil, then it sunk in and you built up a reservoir of, of, of water within the soil. Um, and then we knew about evapotranspiration because we again knew how much you know, solar radiation was coming in and that so we could remove 
water from the system through evapotranspiration. We knew about something about the vegetation cover at particular sites. And ultimately, what we did was go through this process of going from our original raw data to some variables that we thought were really actually important. And in particular, the one that took most effort was this measure of soil water availability. We didn't just have a measure of soil water availability, but we knew that that was crucial, so we put a lot of effort into generating a variable that was sensible based on the soils that were available, the amount of precipitation that was going into the system, and the evapotranspiration out of the system. Okay? So again, when you're doing this kind of modelling, it's not just straightforward, download the data, get something, and stick it through and get an output. To do it really well and really properly, you need to be thinking about I would say some, some of these things. What really are the variables? Do I need to do some extra groundwork to generate the variables that I need to build good models? This is a um, data set that I've mentioned a few times, the World Klim data set. Um, and this is the, uh, the breakdown of what we refer to the bioclimate variables that you can get a download from the World Klim site. And this is what's most commonly used. This is a really well cited and really used. It's a very cool data set. Um, um, that you know you can go out and, 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 and download pretty quickly and these are the variables that most people work with. So the actual raw data from the weather stations is monthly minimum maximum temperature and mean precipitation. Okay, So that's kind of the raw data that they had to work with but then what they've done from that is generate a series of variables that are generally more applicable in ecology and biology. Okay, So instead of saying you know what's the um, Temp the minimum temperature in February, um, we're interested in variables like um, what's the maximum temperature of the warmest month or what's the um, minimum temperature of the coldest month, what's the annual precipitation, what's the precipitation of the driest month, things like what's the precipitation of the warmest quarter, so what three months um, are warmest, what's the precipitation in those three months, so things that Clearly, you know, they're referred to as bioclimate variables because they are, add an element of biology to, to the climate. They're trying to come up with, with variables that aren't just the raw climate data, but they're actually variables that are potentially useful for us biologists in trying to understand biological systems. So those are, you know, folks coming to this and wanting to get going with the first set of data for a, any particular region. These are available one kilometer re resolution globally, easily downloadable. Um, and easily formatable, if that's a word, can easily be formatted to go into most distribution modelling packages or, you know, clunk it in R or um, in, import it into Maxent or something like that. So, so it's a good data set to start with. Okay. So that's um, my quick rundown. And there's, as usual, some references there. That's a quick rundown of general considerations in terms of what environmental data and what biological species distribution data you might have to work with for your study region.